Chapter 12. They broke camp early the following morning and started down towards the pass that would take them across the border once more. Horace had offered Evelyn the black battle horse that had belonged to de Parnier. When she had protested that this was a far superior animal to the bay he rode, he smiled shyly. Maybe so, but I'm used to Kicker. He knows my ways. And that was the end of the matter. The prisoner rode one of the horses they had taken from the Temujai camp. A second was carrying the packs and supplies that, up until now, had been carried by Tug. Naturally, the little ranger horse was now the proud bearer of his long-lost master. As they came closer to the tree line at the bottom of the hill, Tug showed his happiness once more, tossing his head and whinnying. Holt turned in the saddle and smiled. I'm glad he's happy, he said, but I do hope he's not planning on keeping that up all the way home. Will grinned in reply and leaned forward to pat the little horse's shaggy neck. He'll settle down soon enough, he said. At the touch, Tug danced a few paces and tossed his head again. Surprisingly, Abelard copied the actions. Now he's got my horse doing it too, Holt said, more than a little surprised. He calmed Abelard with a quiet word, then turned to Will again. You seem to be popular among the horses of this world anyway. I thought... His voice tailed away and he didn't finish the sentence. Will saw his body stiffen to attention and the grey-cloaked ranger twisted in his saddle, peering into the trees, which were now close on either side. Damn, he muttered quietly. He turned to Horace and Evelyn, riding behind them and leading the prisoner's horse. But before he could speak, there was a scuffle of movement in the trees and a party of armed warriors stepped out into the open behind them, blocking their retreat. Holt swung quickly to the front once more, as a second group emerged from the trees, fanning out to the sides and moving to cut them off in all direction. Scandians! exclaimed Will as he recognised the horned helmets and round wooden shields carried by the silent warriors. Holt's shoulder slumped in a gesture of disgust with himself. Yes, the horses have been trying to warn us. I was so preoccupied by what I thought was Tug's unusual behaviour. I didn't realise it. A burly figure, wearing an enormous horned helmet, and with a double-bladed battle-axe laid negligently over his right shoulder, stepped forward. Behind them, Holt heard the sinister whisper of steel on leather as Horace drew his sword. Without turning, he said, Put it away, Horace. I think there are too many of them, even for you. As Horace had moved, the huge axe had risen instantly to the ready position. The Scandian wielded it as if it were a toy, Now he spoke, and Will started at the familiar voice. I think we'll have you down from those horses, if you don't mind. Unable to stop himself, Will blurted out, Erak! And the man took a pace closer, peering at the second cloaked figure in front of him. The cowl had obscured Will's face so that the Jarl hadn't recognised him. Now he could make out the boy's features, and he frowned as he realised there was something familiar about another one of the riders. Swathed in a cloak against the cold, he hadn't initially recognised Evelyn either. Now, however, he was sure that it must be she. He cursed quietly under his breath, then recovered. Down, he commanded, all of you! He motioned the circle of men back as the four riders dismounted. The fifth, he noticed, with some interest, was tied to his horse and couldn't comply. He gestured for two of his men to get the prisoner down from his saddle. Holt threw back the hood on his cloak and Irak studied the grim, bearded face. Now that he was dismounted, the man looked surprisingly small, particularly measured against Irak's own burly form. Will went to throw back his own cowl, but Irak stopped him with a hand gesture. Leave it for the moment, he said in a lowered voice. He didn't know how many of his men might recognise the former slave who had escaped from Hallisholm months ago. But for now, something told him that the fewer who made the connection, 
the better it would be. He looked warningly at Evelyn. You too, he ordered, and she inclined her head in agreement. Irak turned his gaze back to Holt. I've seen you before, he said. Holt nodded. If you're Jarl Irak, we saw each other briefly on the beach by the fens, he said, and recognition dawned in the Jarl's eyes. It wasn't the man's face that had struck a chord of memory. Rather, his bearing, the way he held himself, and the massive longbow that he carried still. Holt continued. There was quite a distance between us, as I recall. Irak grunted. I seem to remember that we were well within bowshot, he said, and Holt nodded, acknowledging the point. The Scandian's face darkened with anger as he looked once more at the bow and the quiver of arrows slung at Holt's belt. And now you've been up to the same foul business, he said, although what these two have to do with it is beyond me. The last he added in a puzzled tone, jerking a thumb at Will and Evelyn. Now it was Holt's turn to look puzzled. What foul business? Irak gave a disgusted snort. Huh. I've seen you with that ball, remember? I know what you can do, and I've just seen more of your handiwork at Serpent's Pass. Understanding dawned on Holt. He remembered the forlorn sight of the bodies at the small fort on the border. That must be the pass this Scandian was referring to. Since the garrison had been killed by archers and Irak knew Holt's skill with a bow, he had jumped to a rapid, if not too logical, conclusion. Not our work, he said, shaking his head. Irak stepped closer to him. No, I saw them there, all shot, and we followed your tracks from there. So you may have, Holt said calmly. But if you're any sort of tracker, you'd know that there were only two of us. We found the garrison at the pass dead, and we followed the tracks of a larger party, the ones who killed them. Irak hesitated. He wasn't a tracker. He was a sea captain. But one of the men who had come with him was an occasional hunter. While he didn't have the uncanny skills that the rangers had developed in interpreting tracks, Irak now remembered that his man had said something about the possibility of there being two groups. Then, he said, bewildered by this turn of events. If you didn't do it, who did? Holt jerked a thumb at the bound prisoner. Him and his friends, he said. He was in a Temujai scouting party we ran into yesterday. There was a larger band who attacked the border garrison. Then six of them came on into Scandia. Temujai, you say? Irak asked him. He knew of the warlike people from the east, of course but it had been decades since they had come this way in any numbers. We killed a couple of them, Holt said. Two got away and we captured this one. Irak stepped to where the prisoner stood, hands tied in front of him, glaring fiercely at the big northerners who surrounded him. He studied the flat-featured, brown-skinned face and the furs the man wore. He's a Temuj, all right, but what were they doing down here? he asked, almost to himself. That's the question I was asking, Holt replied. Irak glanced at him with a flash of anger. He hated being confused. He preferred a simple, straightforward problem, the kind he could solve with his broad axe. For that matter, he snapped, what are you doing here? Holt faced him evenly, uncowed by the anger in the other man's tone. I came for the boy he said quietly. Irak looked at him, then at the smaller figure beside him, his face still largely concealed by the grey mottled hood. His anger faded as quickly as it had flared. Yes, he said in a calmer tone, he said you would. Like most Scandians, Irak valued loyalty and courage. Another thought struck him, something he'd wondered about for some time. At the beach, he said. How did you know to find us there? You left one of your men behind, Holt said. He told me. The disbelief was plain on Irak's face. Nordell? He'd have spat in your eye before he told you anything. I think he thought he owed me, Holt said quietly. He was dying and he'd lost his sword, 
so I gave it back to him. Iraq went to speak, stopped, hesitated. Scandians believed that if a man died without a weapon in his hand, his soul was lost forever. It seemed the ranger knew about this belief. Then I'm in your debt, he said finally. Then after another pause, I'm not sure how this affects this current situation, however. He rubbed his beard thoughtfully, looking at the fierce little Temujai warrior, for all the world like a tethered hawk. I'd still like to know what this lad and his bunch are up to. That's what I had in mind, Holt told him. I was planning to get my companions here across the border into Tutland. Then I thought I might come back with our friend here and find the rest of the Temujai and see how many of them there are. Irak snorted. Huh, you think he'll tell you? He asked. I don't know too much about the Temujai, but I know this much. You can torture them to death, and they'll never tell you anything, not if they don't want to. Yes, I've heard that too, Holt said. But there might be a way. Oh, might there? The Jarl asked scornfully. And what might that way be? Holt glanced at the horse warrior. He was following their discussion with some interest. Holt knew he spoke the trading language, but he had no idea how much of the common tongue he might understand. As a member of a scouting party, it was probable that he had some command of the language. He took the Jarl's arm and led him a few paces away, out of earshot. I rather thought I might let him escape, he said mildly.